is great. It really is great. God, I wish I could. Uh, well, you did it for matting, apparently, didn't you? Because the um, Keep Wales Tidy sponsored sponsored it with some wildflower meadow matting. It's just remarkable how well it's established. Who wouldn't want this in their garden, really, when you when you see how interesting this is compared to a mown lawn? So now, that's the talking we have Simon from uh, Lumpy Wall Gardens, who's going to talk to you about? We'll talk about gardening with nature in mind, I guess. It's okay. going to be a kind of two-way street, hopefully, between some of you and myself. Uh, it's going to be yeah, more, more discussion and thoughts and some things I feel passionately about. Great. We'll just see where it takes us. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank I was horticulturally trained in, in, in conventional colleges and uh, linking with what we're doing here today, it's quite relevant really because in agricultural and horticultural colleges, certainly in the 70s and 80s, but certainly did continue well beyond that, a lot of the course was about identifying pests and diseases uh, and weeds and then recognising the best pesticides to use for the pests, diseases and weeds and the rates of chemical application and how regular you did it and how many days you had to leave the crops if they were edible or ornamental so they'd be safe for, they'd be safe for, for, for human consumption. So that was the standard horticultural training. Obviously you learned all about plants generally and how to grow them and soils and climate and temperature and humidity and all the rest of it. But, but a big part was about this um, controlling nature, I suppose, because nature's bad if you're trying to grow one type of plant. And I've used all the nasty chemicals, you know, the metastasis stocks and um, uh, tobacco, uh, nicotine, nic nicotine shreds back in the early days, used to get a big pot of like cardboard that had been soaked in nicotine, pure nicotine. Mm -hmm. And they used to put, take lumps of this sort of shredded cardboard out and put them in piles down the greenhouse and then you'd work backwards with the door behind you open <laughs> and you'd just strike a match and light this nicotine as you're going backwards. And once the, the nursery dog was under the bench in the, uh, in the greenhouse, I didn't realise it, it all fills with this noxious nicotine because it kills things like red spider and white fly and they fit really really well but it also kills dogs and people quite well as well and um, luckily I remember I just rushed back in and got the dog out and, and we all survived but, but so, so, that, so that sort of poisons uh, side of the life was, was, was very normal for me I worked for a big farming group for seven years uh, biggest farming group in Europe the co-op used to have more land than uh, almost more land than the church and Prince Charles they had tens of thousands of agricultural acres across Scotland, England and Wales. And uh, they were a very good farming company, but again, they used conventional systems. And I learned to steer, to drive a big tractor with a 12 metre boom and cover fields with <laughs> lots of pesticide. Um, so I've seen that side of it, so I get a full appreciation of why we did it. It worked very well as far as growing the crops without much blemish on them. Uh, was tomatoes I grew for three years and we used to use a product on tomatoes which is perfectly legal and acceptable because one of the biggest problems with greenhouse crop is you've got this climate where pests multiply really quickly so we'll, know, we'll all know that King Gardeners here so you've got a greenhouse with aphids, red spider mite, white fly, scale insect these sorts of things are a real real problem to try and keep on top of so we've, the easiest thing in the past is to we go to a cupboard and pick up something and spray it on the crop to get rid of the problem. 
And um, on a commercial tomato greenhouse, you had to make sure you did that. That was, the, that was the necessary system. And we used to use something called temic granules. And that was such a nasty chemical that you couldn't have it in a liquid form. It was too dangerous to handle. So it was in a, in a granule, and you had to have an application kind of machine which dropped a little kind of teaspoon on each pot. And you had to have a full respirator kit and completely clothed in rubber. Uh, it contained aldicarb, and you remember the uh, Bhopal disaster in India? That's where they used to make it. And it, and it, it got released as, in the factories of gas. If it touches water, it turns into a gas, kills everything. And that was for tomato culture. So, um, so you know, so, so things have moved on. And this was only 25 years ago. No, it wasn't 35 years ago, I suppose. It's banned now. But that's where we've come from, that's where agriculture's come from, that's where horticulture's come from, and, uh, and it's a very slow, but, but decent change. So now the tomatoes now don't have any pesticides I'm aware of anymore. They use biological control agents, which you're probably familiar with. So we, we import, we used to import bumblebees to pollinate them from Belgium. Um, and you couldn't spray the crop then because you'd kill your bumblebees off. We used to uh, import um, little phytoceles mites to, to, to gobble up all the red spider, a bit like you would with ladybirds. We used to import lacewings to eat all the aphids. Uh, and we learned better ways of controlling the environment so you didn't need to keep spraying for diseases on the leaves and the fruit. So there are, we are, there are better and better ways now of growing, safer and safer ways of growing, and um, better, better for the environment. And I, and I think the same is happening in gardening. I used to run the garden centre as well for a few years, and I, I'm a bit jaded by it now, the garden centre world, I guess, because when I look at garden centres now, I, I, see, I see all the things that are wrong with them rather than the things that are right with them, I guess. There's an awful lot of plastic in a garden centre. Uh, and there's also a lot of poison in the garden centre. Uh, you, you can just you can kill pretty well anything you want to with a garden centre shelf. And um, I think gardeners have to stop buying these products. You know? so, so for so long, we've been used to as gardeners going for the easy fix all the time and it's just killing everything off uh, and I think gardeners are worse than horticulturists and farmers actually because they have more of a choice uh, so we shouldn't have bang, bang away at these farmers unless we're doing better in our gardens uh, lawns are the classic and that, that message is getting through isn't it really it's no, no mo may has been catchy but it's worked and if you look at that lovely meadow we've got out here, it's only a year old, isn't it? Uh, it's fantastic, that meadow. And if, if, you, if, if our lawns could look like that, even for six months to the year or five months to the year, it's got to be the way to go, rather than this, this tightly mown patch of grass that we spray with moss killer and uh, clover killer and add fertiliser to and and, and run a fossil fuel mower over it every week. Lots of accidents, people end up in a &E all the time from streamer and mower accidents. Uh, and yet, you know, you get this beautiful meadow that, that, that's so much better for wildlife. Um, so, so I think there's some simple fixes. It's understanding what the issues are, really. And so I, I'm trying more and more in my garden in Amphi Wall Garden to garden for nature and keep challenging myself to get better at it. And I, I've selected plants that I know are good for pollinators and other insects. It's not just pollinators, I mean, today's about pollinators. But to me, pollinators is the you know, keystone group of, of, of insects that we understand quite well. We kind of understand what a pollinator does and why it's important. But all the tears are important. The ground spiders are important. The wrens, 90% you know, of the wrens diet is spiders. And people go, ooh, spiders, I hate spiders, but we like wrens. But, you know, they're both of them. So, and, and, and spiders are really easily killed in the garden if you use any chemical whatsoever. So I, I take a lot of pleasure from some of my longer grass, seeing loads of little spiders just growing, just, 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 just living in the understory of the grass. I know that it's actually quite a healthy system I've got just by seeing the spiders there, because there's all the tiers between below, below the spider size and above the spider size. Because when it gets small on the spider, we can't see it. But actually there's many more creatures, more important still, that you can't even see. So you need to have some indicators of what's working. I think if you see lots of little spiders in, in your longer grass, that's a good thing. Grasshoppers is another good thing, for example. 
So I've chosen plants and put them together to try and create the beautiful wildlife zones in my garden. And it's worked quite well with the Verbena banariensis, for example, uh, in the autumn. is a fabulous thing. And, 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 and Helenium is another one, sunflowers another one. And at one time I counted 400 butterflies in one part of the garden year before last, at one, at one time when the butterfly count was on. A lot of them were painted ladies that come over from the med, but a lot of them weren't. And there were literally, you know, four, the garden was a flock of them, and I hadn't seen that since I was about 12, I don't know. I remember seeing that quite a lot as a kid. Uh, you know, you'd go to a pub, a beer garden or something, and the buzzers would be full of... I wasn't going to, well, perhaps I was going to pub at 12, but only because my parents took me there. Uh, but, you know, I used to see flocks of, you know, clouds of butterflies, and you don't see them much anymore. But even though I could create some of those things knowing some of the plants are really suitable, the areas I was leaving wild that I hadn't done anything to, that for one or two, even three years, I, I would leave patches around the wall garden. If I sat there and carefully studied that area, there was far more going on in this patch this big that I hadn't done anything to, where you had stinging nettles and thistles and lots of different grass species, that's important, and everything in between. There's far more insect life going on there, and voles, hedgehogs, um, than any place I was trying to create. Because it had the tiers, all the different tiers of planting. So you had the ground cover, and you had the herbs, and you had the shelter, and the shade, and you had seed, and you had leaf, and you had flower. So you're covering the whole wide range. So I'm realising that to garden well for nature, we've got to share the garden with nature and not decide every single part of it ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been taken up much by other people, obviously. Wildlife Trusts are big proponents of rewilding. And that's just trying to let nature do what it wants to do in that particular part of the area. And it's really difficult to do that because we always think we know better because we read up about it, and we're keen conservationists, and our country's probably the best country for understanding what our nature is, what our species are doing, but actually we're one of the worst countries in the world for nature. That's, that's, the, that's the cruel irony, is we've got more nature lovers and more understanding of nature and more surveys of nature than anywhere else I know around the world, and yet our nature's going down and down and down and down, because we don't translate that passion into lifestyle choices. Uh, this week I was sad to read that uh, the International Union of uh, Conservation of Nature, IUCN, who look at all species across the, the world, you know the red list, the endangered red list, they produce the red list of all species, and the UK figures for butterflies came out last month, which they've just published. And species apparently. Four are already, are already extinct and of the rest 52% are threatened or near threatened uh, because we're losing the habitat that we're, we're not just not just the flowers because often we just talk about flowers because the honeybees have been such an iconic species for us but the caterpillars have to live somewhere. The caterpillars don't live on flowers generally. They usually live on grasses and we don't even see grasses as, a, as an important species, we just see it as a lawn. Not everyone, but generally, grass isn't seen as an important species, it? and it's so, so important. Um, so you have to leave those wilder areas to allow those native grass species to grow, for the adult butterfly to come along to lay the egg on the, on the grass, or whatever native herb you might have in that area, to be able to feed undisturbed and not be streamed every couple of weeks because they don't like that very much, or mode, <laughs> and, and, and they have to allow that whole cycle. Um, and we're not doing it enough, apparently. Well, we're not. Uh, and we can all do that bit. That's, uh, I think, I think uh, I'm not meant to be... Um, don't want it to be depressing, it's just factual. And, and I think we have to just say, well, what can we do about that? So butterflies, to me, are more iconic than... Well, well, we shouldn't compare species, really. but they're very iconic and they're gorgeous and everyone loves them. And yet, you know, in this country, half of them are threatened with extinction. It's absolutely bizarre. Um, and so we need to start looking at life cycle of things, I think, if we're really interested in, 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 in a species, rather than just go, that's a painted lady or that's a 
tortoise shell or you know or a peacock actually well what's a caterpillar look like what's the life cycle does it overwinter as a caterpillar or as an egg or even an adult what's its food what's it, what food type is it and we know that nettles a good peacock for example i think we all know that one so you need a patch of nettles for for your peacock butterfly to overwinter and then feed feed its young one in the spring but we need to know them all really and understand how long you need to leave those nettles for example is it, is, it, is, it, is it the spring important or is it the autumn that's important? Because in the past, of course, these places were left. Farming of old used to have unproductive areas, undrained areas, hedgerows with hedge banks where things like nettles and brambles always grew. But now they're not. They haven't got that anymore. We can't rely on that at the moment. So those, those wildlife habitats, the zones around the farm and land, were the places where these creatures lived. And the hedgerows were thicker and managed by hand, so you had a depth of, 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 of um, hedgerow, which allowed creatures to go inside and protect. The reason the hedgehogs are smashed, uh, one obviously will not get killed on the road, but uh, my theory is, I mean, there's lots of badgers that are eating them, but badgers and, and hedgehogs have, have co-evolved. So how come badgers are eating them now when they didn't used to eat them 100 years ago? And a badger will eat a hedgehog, but it, it's not its choice of food, it's not, it's not go-to food, it's just if, if it's hungry and it's there, it'll eat it. And I reckon if you look at some really maintained hedgerows, you can see how a hedgehog can push through into the centre of a really thick, heavy, thorny hedge, and even the badger's going to struggle to get right into there. But if you look at hedgerows now, look at the base of them. You just put your arm in, and there's gaps like that. There's nowhere for, if I was a hedgehog, there's nowhere where I, I could sit, sensibly hide. So it's those sorts of things that are happening which, which we can often miss, really. And we can produce that in our own garden. If you've got a big enough garden, you can have a bit of a hedge line, make it thick, have lots of natives in there. You can add some other exciting things in if you want to. Um, but that, you know, that's... Uh, it, it, it's trying to really pinpoint these, these areas where it's perhaps going a, bit, going a bit awry, I think. Anyway, any, any thoughts or any comments or any experiences from the floor? Please, because I could go on for ages. Yes, Nolly? You've said that um, people in Britain are aware of biodiversity and they're aware of nature and the problems that is happening due to gardening and agriculture mm. compared to Europe. Mm. So are you saying that although we're more aware and conscious of farming practices and horticultural practices in European countries that different then that their work like, isn't as endangered as it is in Britain, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, well, 90% so we're so aware. It, yeah, it's, 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 it, partly it's the um, population on the land mass in Britain. You know, France has got four times as much land as we have in the, as the UK, um, with a population not much bigger, so they've got more space. So we've got more roads, more buildings. Um, 90% of all the land in Wales, 90% is farmed. It's incredible. So if the farming system doesn't support nature, we're buggered really, you know, because almost all the land is, is farmed. It's 80% in England. So it's huge, so huge percentages of our land are farmed. And they haven't been farmed with nature in mind, because the funding mechanism has been very much monocropping, be it sheep or cereal or, or, or whatever. And there have been there has been funding to try and support conservation and nature, but it's, it's it's generally been a secondary funded thing. So I think it's partly a percentage of land that is farmed. The, 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 the Europe farm in a similar way, in fairness, mostly. But I took myself to Romania about four years ago because I wanted to <coughs> experience a method of farming that we don't have anymore, just as a holiday. And I went to the north to Maramures, so Transylvania is near the, t near the north, where most people go, because of Dracula, and it's also quite a nice place to go. But I wanted to go even more rural than that, so I went up to Maramures, and overlooking the river to Ukraine, as it turned out. <coughs> and um, they're still using wooden carts, handmade wooden carts, and still pulling them with horses or ox. And, and, and they're still cutting crops with, with hand tools. Um, and they still have the letters. They have these, these, these open meadows, which we used to have. And I've never really seen an open meadow. You know, here about 97% of our meadows have been lost 
since the Second World War, which is true. And I wanted to see what a meadow looked like, to be honest, because I'm seeing them our meadows, but they're not the pretend meadows, are they? They're nice, very nice meadows, uh, but they're all young meadows. And the one thing I'm starting to realise about nature is that length of duration is important. How long woodlands have been woodlands, how long meadows have been meadows. It's not, you can't just transform nature in, in a single season. Species take years, decades, sometimes hundreds of years to come back in properly. So I wanted to see what it was unspoiled, if you like. And it was fascinating because there they were, there was all these wild flowers, quite sparse, but over huge mountain ranges. And there were also kind of wild fruits growing as well. There were damsons and cherries and plums and crab apples. And, and there was just a random scabby tree here and there, but they're full of fruit. And of course, no chemicals were being used because no one's going to, they couldn't, they haven't got tracked, well, some of them got tracked, because most of it is not farmed in that way. So, of course, you know, we're not going to go back to that, but, but it was good to see, and then you've got the insects and you've got the butterflies, they're all, it's all there, it's still there in, in, in this place. And I think gardeners have a chance to do this because apparently 44,000 hectares of land in the UK is gardens. 44,000 hectares. It's a huge area of land that's garden. Do you want to come and sit down? There's loads at the front somewhere if you want to sit down. So I think there's a great opportunity to, um, to do what we all want to do, actually, is to see more creatures in our, in our gardens and still have a beautiful garden. And it's very, it's very doable. It's very doable, but you've got to, you've got to all change our mindset, really. Because we've been here for 17 years now, and wildlife, particularly bird life and spoilers and stuff like that, is just decreasing monumentally. It is. Um, yeah. We're farmed as environmentally as we can, but we are in the middle of silage fields. Yeah. Um, and we can't do anything about the, the weather here in Wales, we can't change it. How do you think we can actually reverse it on a small scale of people like ourselves? I think talk to neighbours. That's difficult, they're farmers. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think, I don't, yeah, they're I not going to... I was a farmer, and okay, I wasn't a proper farmer, I was a farmer for seven years. Um, I've, I've connected with my farmers, because mm -hmm. they own the land. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 they own the land, you know. Um, so, the farmer down below me, Martin Jones, brilliant guy, he's, got, he's turned Jews Lake into a campsite. And it's a low-lying, wet meadow area. And so I've been... <laughs> Hmm? That's nice for a <laughs> It's on banks. Um, so I've been speaking to him about improving the biodiversity and the, and the nature, and the abundance of nature, because I think one, of, one thing is counting species and saying what species are we losing, which is depressing, but I think as important is the abundance. Seeing one peacock butterfly is, is all very well, but you know, I'd like to see a hundred peacock butterflies, we used to. So, so try to increase the number of, uh, of each species as well. And he's allowed me to plant one to 2,000 trees on his land and pays me for it, that I can choose. Because I want my environment to be enhanced and I can't plant 2,000 trees in my garden. He's letting me plant one to 2,000 trees every year and I've done for five years now, of species I decide are suitable on his land to give him more shelter for his campers, but also more wildlife. So that's, that's helped. Um, also, Billy up the road from me, I'm going to plant 100 oaks in his site next year. He, he wants to do more for nature, but doesn't have the time or the knowledge or the physical capacity or whatever it is. Uh, but I also, the garden I've taken on in 2015, which is an amphibian garden site, it's, it's, it's behind the cottage. It's a two thirds of an acre, and when I went there, it was a grass paddock. Uh, with a couple of ponies in and I wanted to turn it into a wall garden and make it productive and I wanted to try and do it without chemicals and without too many machines and I was quite disappointed because on one side Billy's land he rents out to an organic farmer and that's all organic so I thought this is going to be full of teeming wildlife it's been organic for over a decade that's cool and the other side is farm more conventionally so it's, it's, it's inorganic it's, it's, um, it's pesticides or whatever but I thought this whole sweep around him and I was working away in the garden, I spent many, many, many hours in the garden. And there was nothing in the garden at all. There wasn't, there wasn't even birds in the garden. There was absolutely nothing in the garden. Because it just had this grass. 
2,000 acre grass. They've got a pony down living next to it. <coughs> and they were started to cultivate it. And there was, there was nothing. There wasn't even earthworms in the soil. No beetles, no birds, no, 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 no mammals, no foals, nothing at all. Uh, and I realised there was no, when I mean, you think about it, there's no water in the garden, there's no food in the garden, and there's no shelter in the garden. It's like us living without a house, really. You know, you need the water, you need the food in the kitchen, and you need some shelter. So if you don't have any of those things, you, why, why would nature be there? It's got nothing, it's got no, no place to be. So each year I've just enjoyed seeing new species coming into the garden as I'm building the layers up. And I still haven't done the water, which should have been the first thing I did. But apparently, what we can do simply, there's certain things that have been proved to work for nature. Water, providing clean water. It doesn't need to be too much, but you know, a pond or something. Providing dead wood, dead and decaying wood. Because again, you think that's weird in a garden, but it's not weird because 45% of all our insect life in the UK lives in dead and decaying wood. So if you haven't got dead and decaying wood in your garden, you've limited yourself to 50% of the invertebrates in the country, straight away. So just a few logs. Anyway, have a compost heap, have a bit of wood beside it, or under a hedgerow, it doesn't really matter. And then the third thing, so you've got water, you've got dead and decaying wood. And the third thing is layers. I think woodland, really. Okay, we can't all have woodlands, but you can have different layers. So you start off with a sort of ground cover herb layer. Ideally, you've got some old leaves left there first in places. Don't sweep all the leaves up, leaves them under the edges. And then you've got a herb layer, ground cover layer. Could be, could be, it doesn't have to be native, it could be anything. It could be vinca, you know, it could be um, hellebore. But loads of it. You don't want to see the soil, basically. If you can see soil, you're, you're missing a trick. You shouldn't see any soil at any time. Um, so it's, and, then, and then you plant the next layer, which might be potentillas or, you know, or herbaceous of some sort, geranium or something. And then you go up another layer again, which might be five, six, seven foot trees, uh, shrubs. And then try and put some small trees in as well. And it's the layering that, that, that nature needs. It needs shelter, it needs shade, it needs different food sources, it needs places to nest. All, all creatures different, need different things. Um, I think we've got to put those things into our garden and think more in, in, in those sort of structural ways. It doesn't really matter what you use. We get hung up on the plants, but nature doesn't seem to mind that so much. As long as you've got variety, the most amazing things will happen. So if you just do those three things, water, dead and decaying wood, and, 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 and layers, planting in layers, they are the three most dramatic changes to nature in your garden. And that's been proven by some really good studies. And one last thing I'll talk about, just because I I've known a bit, a bit about now because I've just been doing a, a degree in um, environmental conservation at Swansea, and I, I decided to study mycorrhizal fungi just as a topic, and I wanted to see you know, what effect mycorrhizal fungi has on tree growth, really. <coughs> and, um, and I'm sure there might well be people who know so far more about it than I do, so I apologise if I, if I say anything that's nonsense, but to the best of my knowledge. Mycorrhizal fungi um, turns out to be something I've never even heard about. Well, I heard about it when I first went to college in 79, 80, that we used mycorrhizal fungi in uh, rooting beds for conifers. The Forestry Commission used to put mycorrhizal fungi into their rooting beds when they sowed seed for pines because they were planting pines out onto the top of hillside to have no soil. So they, they, the plant immediately had its own mycorrhizal fungi on the root system when they planted it out in, 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 the, in the hills. So they were using them back in 50 years ago. Uh, but what I haven't really appreciated, and I've been in horticulture all my life, we haven't really talked about it. When, when a plant's hungry, I feed it with a fertilizer. And it turns out that in nature, 80, no, no, 92%, 92% of all plants in nature need mycorrhizal fungi. So pretty well all of them, pretty well all of them. A, a few groups don't, but pretty well all plants across the world need mycorrhizal fungi. And one of the key benefits of mycorrhizal fungi is it pulls phosphates, which is a limiting growth nutrient in most places. It puts these mats of mycorrhizal fungi out for metres and metres and metres and metres. And, and it works in a kind of concentric way, it just goes out from the centre 
it keeps going out, it keeps going out, underground. These, these, these mycelium run out and out and out. And they then latch onto a, a source of phosphate in some rock somewhere. And they can dissolve the rock, because they're clever, the fungi. They can dissolve the rock and release the phosphate. And they pull it through the micro, mycelium. And then they feed it, and they grow into the roots of all these plants. They're growing inside the roots. So it's not, it's not a fungi in the plant anymore. The microbes, half, half of them, grow into the root system. They're part of the tree. And they're just pulling all the, micro, all the phosphates straight in and giving them to the tree. And they can even work out which trees need phosphates more than others. And they, and they follow this tracking. And if there's a tree that's really struggling, they'll divert and give it to more phosphates. Unbelievable. And yet, if you use bone meal in gardening, which we do, because when you plant a tree, it's got a good root system, and what promotes healthy rooting? Phosphate. That's what we use bone meal, because it's full of phosphate. You put a good old handful of phosphate, bone meal into the plant, you know, and you stick your poor old plant straight on top of it. Um, and it's like, wow! It was like a Coke hit. And uh, one thing mycorrhizal fungi doesn't like? High phosphate levels. <laughs> So you're actually discouraging any natural mycorrhizal activity around that plant that would have benefited that plant naturally in your soil by chucking a load of phosphate in there. So that was, I found that really shocking because for 20 years, 30 years I've been recommending that as a principle. But that's human thinking. Yes. Oh, it needs phosphate. Oh, I'll chuck a load of phosphate in a big handful. How much? Oh, a handful for one plant. So that's interesting. So nature hates that. Hates that and that kills off the mycorrhizae around there. It's like, God, it? So that's that. So so that, so there's so we've got to think not just what we see, but actually below ground we can't see it. And it's quite incredible what's happening with with, with the fungi uh, world. What it can do, it helps in drought. It helps plants with drought because it pulls water from damper places. It helps repel diseases on the plant roots because it got, it can fight off diseases for plants. <coughs> what it doesn't like though, which is where we're going wrong, is this no dig policy we hear about. That's got a lot to do with it, because if you, if you dig your mycorrhizal, if you turn your soil, the mycorrhizal, the mycelium dries out, dies. It's not supposed to be above ground with the wind and the, and, the, and the sun, so that's not how it's designed. The only bit that comes up is a toadstool or the mushroom we're, we're familiar with, and that's fine, that's designed to do that, and that's to release spores to go and inhabit new areas. Because most of the ones we eat, most of the fungi we eat are actually mycorrhizal fungi. Um, seps, for example. Uh, a very important one for beech, a birch, rather things like that. So digging disturbs that not just the mycorrhizal fungi, but also the soil dwelling creatures who live in layers in the soil. It's pretty obvious when you think about it, because some of them like living just at the very top centimetre of the soil. That's where they like being. You know, we know that from ponds. That was something like you know, pond skates sit on the top of the pond. They don't want to be at the bottom of the pond. They want to be at the top. Newts like going down a bit. It's the same in the soil. You've got all these different creatures running all the way through the top foot or so or so of the soil. And we go like that. <laughs> and they're eating tiny. And then they've got to go, oh my God. <laughs> you know, and they've got to work the way. We know this in compost heap. There's certain worms. You know, the, the, what are the banded worms that eat the, um, what are they called? Brandlings. Brandlings, yeah. The brandlings, which are the really active worms that love munching through loads and loads of composting material. They hate the light. If you turn them upside down, within 20 seconds they're gone again because they want to be down under cover and safe. And so digging is doing that all the time and it's killing lots of insects and it's killing lots of fungi, beneficial fungi. So if you can garden without doing that, that's helping again. So what I do now, it's been really difficult in the veggie area, is I compost loads, so I've got massive parts of compost and they're full of critters. So I will hoe the, the garden. If I want to sow some veg or plant some veg now, rather than dig it and, and weed it, and I will hoe off just before I want to plant. So the structure's left the same. I'm just taking off the top growth from whatever was there before. And then I'll bring some compost, two or three inches of my <coughs> homemade compost, spread it over the top, and that becomes my tilth if I want to sow, for example. I won't do it if I'm planting. I can just plant straight in even though they're sort of pretty scabby looking. I'll just plant and they seem to do fine. But if I want to sow, I will bring some of my own compost and sow into that. And that's leaving the soil structure together and um, hopefully helping nature help us. And the other thing is from the floor before I shut up. 
So I don't think it's all lost. No, I think there's loads we can do. There's loads we can do. We mustn't, mustn't give up hope. That must change the way we look at everything. Well, I'm becoming one just because, because of the studies I've looked at show that it doesn't, it's, it's bad for nature. It's good for us because it's nice and clean and tidy and, you know, it's like, it's just a clean sweep each time. But if it's damaging the structure within the soil, the living soil, and damaging it, and it's releasing lots of uh, carbon, because uh, the organic matter will be released into the air when you do that, um, and it, and it oxidises, so some of the, the humus in your soil will be oxidising when you do that as well, so you're reducing your organic content. Well, yes. you know, there's a lot of things I've heard about Charles Dow, particularly Charles Dow, is you just keep bumming more and more compost on top. Most of us haven't got facilities for that amount of compost. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I, I just don't think you would get the yields that make it viable for a small garden. I, well, the way I'm gardening now is I actually leave my veggie garden. It's got so many buttercups in at the moment. So many <laughs> poppies, so many, probably 40 different species of flowering plant within the veggie area. Okay. And the pumpkin, I've just decided to slap right in the middle of I've got some parsnips that were left over from last year that are flowering and look great and are great for pollinators. I've got poppies, I've got some grass, I've got some buttercups. And I've just dug a little hole and put the pumpkin in the middle of that and it can just fight its way through because it's tough, big and tough. So rather than normally, I'd have cleaned it all off and made a big effort and cleaned it And I think, well, why bother? I'm only going to get one or two pumpkins and it'll probably do its own thing anyway. And the garden looks quite attractive and we'll have a pumpkin. So, so a lot of things you don't need to... I mean, leeks and onions, you probably have to have a clean... You'd have to get started. So do a raised bed. You know, do it on a raised bed so you can leave your garden soil alone. That, that'll be fine. Lettuce probably you've got to have a clean area, otherwise you just get hammered with holes and, and moulds. But, but many other things you don't, really. Kale you don't. That will fight most weeds off, I think. Carrots, yeah, carrots. carrots. Well, raised no carrots. Maybe raised mm. Then again, that's more construction into the garden. Yeah, there's no perfect answer. Can I just ask you... Oh, sorry. Have you, um, you come across agro-homeopathy? Have you used anything um, no. to support your... Homeopathy? Mm. No. I've just started getting interested in it. Mm. And, I mean, I, I use things like... Um, and I, I, I don't know how harmful it might be, actually, to... I have an idea it's not, but actually I could be totally wrong because I use bone meal, so... Um, so. But I use some um, garlic... I make a garlic spray mm. for the hostas. Um, um, but I just got interested in there's something, there's a homeopathic remedy called a helix tosta, which is um, literally toasted snail shell. Um, which is supposed to be good for terror. I kind of, I've been looking at various things. One of the things I've come across was something called um, if, a, if a plant is really ailing, Mm-hmm. Um, to use silica, right. a re- homeopathic remedy, silica, which um, is like a tonic, which I I've used on a on a, a, a rose. It's a, actually a rambling rose, which I had um, brought from a, an old garden, and it's been in a pot for fa- far too long. This mm-hmm. poor rambler, and it was really struggling. Um, and since I I gave it the, the silica, it's actually, it's revived. Okay. Um, but, but it's, and yeah, I, I mean this, the, the, the thing about intervention and non-intervention, that's an intervention because I, I see that it needs something and I can't provide it what it needs no. at the moment, which is ground. I can't provide it with the ground. So I have to provide it with something else, but I, I didn't. I didn't well, know. Well, I think no. I think you're asking yourself, really. I think it's intervention uh, of, of with limited understanding, because we don't, you know, we someone yeah. writes something, well, sounds like a good idea. I can do that, mm. and, and you don't actually know what you're doing, really. And mm. um, if it works, it works for that. But what else is it doing? What, 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 yes. what are you yeah. doing? Yeah. I don't know. And of course, the soil is what it wants. So, and, and you can help though if you're going to use a container to use soil rather than something purchased in a bag. Because yeah, soil has so much more to it than just yes. a growing medium. 
Yes. So that helps. And Rose is always suffering from the pot. They dry out, they get black spot, they get powdery mildew, and we used to think spray them rather than grow them properly. Um, we, we, we try and spray the problems away. So I think. But there I, are things like, say, for black spot, milk and water. Or grow the plant properly in the first place. If, if, if it suffers, if yeah. it suffers from drought, yeah. it'll get black spot. Yeah. You know, often, often yeah. a, a healthy growing rose, some, some roses, new modern ones, are hopeless. Okay, they're weak growing, hybrid teas, uh, and they, they suffer all sorts of vapors. But many, many roses planted in a good soil, well established, won't get black spot. You won't have to spray for it. So it's it, again, it's 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 looking at the the cause of the black spot rather than dealing with the black spot. It's the same as pests. Why have you got pests in the garden? Why are we spraying for pests? If you have enough lace wings, ladybirds and all the rest, because you have enough habitat within your garden. I don't spray for anything now. And I don't seem to get any problems with any major pests or diseases. So you, you look after the habitat and you look after the soil? We do. Yeah, well, I try to. I mean, you can pick holes in everything I'm doing easily. You know, it's, it's, I'm a million miles away from where I'd like to be. But I see it, I see it working, and it's much easier. You, don't, you know, it's, it's easier. And it's more interesting, because the, the grasses seed, and they're beautiful, I love our grasses. And they seed, and they're, they're, they're something in their own right. Uh, the, the buttercups, which is, you know, someone came around the garden last week, and we were gardening, but, oh, don't you hate buttercups? My enemy number one in my garden. And we heard this morning, it's one of the top four plants in, in pollen, pollen in, in pollinators. Mm -hmm. Buttercup, ranunculus, is one of the top four. Mm -hmm. So a bramble is number one. Mm -hmm. you know? So all the things we hate and see as problems are the things that nature rely on to live. And we're completely at odds all the time without even realising it. So where are all our butterflies gone? It's terrible. And then we get, we get rid of all that bramble, which they're using to feed on. Um, so it's, it's trying to make all that work in smaller and smaller gardens, which I appreciate is, is difficult, but not impossible. Sorry, you had something to say. Oh, I, I came in a bit late, so I don't know if you sort of talked about, like if you wanted to get rid of something you didn't want to dig, you, um, you could cover it, you know, cover it in cardboard or... Yeah, you could, or compost, garden compost. Yeah. Hoe it off and have a, have a plant off and then cover it in. Something, something yeah. good for the soil, yeah. the carbon will work. Yeah. Carbon will work. We yeah. haven't got garden compost. Yeah. Yeah. Save so digging it and then disturbing all of that. Mm. I mean, one of the things about these the zones, the soil zones, <coughs> I had a real problem with snails when we moved into the garden because it's limestone, stone wall, and sh the shells are full of calcium for snails. They love limestone so they can get, lick, lick my walls and uh, build <laughs> nice strong homes. And I had thousands and thousands and thousands of snails, I didn't get fed up with them. I try not to kill anything, so I just sling them over the wall for about two years. So mm -hmm. I got quite good at throwing them over the wall. And it didn't seem to make any difference at all. And um, I started standing on them in the end, I got so fed up with them. I thought, well, the birds can eat them now. But it still wasn't quite working. And then the family came to stay, and I decided to do a little trial. So very quickly, we collected 200 snails, very quickly. 100 in one uh, wheelbarrow and 100 in another, and we painted the shells with uh, silver and red nail varnish. And my, one of my daughters came down. So we had 100 red ones and 100 silver ones. And the 100 silver ones we threw over the wall again. So they went about 30 metres, I would say, something like that, into the field. And the other 100 I took down to Freshwater East, <coughs> which is a mile and a half away. We dropped them off in a hedgerow somewhere. That came up with it. I just wanted to see if they had much of a homing signal, really. Um, which it turns out most things do have. It seems to happen. And it started to rain a day after, typically, and so this, this uh, paint didn't last forever. But the following day or two, we had 30 of those 100 silver ones back in the garden. So it could have, could have easily been more. 30 I saw. And about a week later, one red one <laughs> came up into the car park, up the track. Well, I don't know how it got there, but it came somehow. I couldn't leave that, that ridiculous distance. And apparently someone's done a PhD in there, and there's, there's a long, over a quarter of a mile of the signal. They want to be where they were brought up. 
and everything wants to be where it's brought up, you know. And the soil inhabitants want to be in the bit they were brought up, and they don't want to be turned upside down. So it's tr it's appreciating every single bit of nature has its own niche, really, and trying to let it stay there as long as possible, not messing with it too much. So we need to learn to love the snails, is it? Well, I've got ducks. So that's my natural way of doing it, is that um, the ducks now take out the slugs and snails in my garden area, because they're allowed to just forage in the garden area. And that's, that's worked for me. At least I'm not using anything unnatural. So, that, yeah, that's, that's worked quite well, actually, because that is a big problem. It's only really a problem if you're trying to grow food crops. No, we get hung up on slugs because we're trying to grow lettuce or runner beans or hostas. Most of the plants they don't touch, actually. And most slugs don't touch the plants that we're worried about. There's only a few species that are actually a problem, but we kill them all. Like we kill grass snakes because we think they might bite us and that sort of thing. Toby. You introduced hedgehogs to the, or gatherers to the garden. How did that go? Oh, it's Billy really soon after, which is quite annoying. lived under his sofa in his bed, his porch. Um, yeah, which is rather annoying. Um, no, they, they come back, I think, because I don't see them at night, but I see their poop. So they come to the garden, I don't know where they live, I've never seen them. But I, I introduced them, yeah, I got them from the Pembrokeshire Hogs, Hogs Spitzel, that's a great name. And I've got a three-legged one, they're called Stumpy, um, and a blind one as well. I thought it'd be a good idea to have a normal garden, so didn't go down the road or anything. Uh, so they, yeah, they, they've stayed. They've stayed and they do whatever they do, I guess. And there is badges. There's a badger set. I've taken night cam photography last winter, last spring. Three badges. Um, and they don't seem to bother the hedgehogs. So, yeah. So, yeah, hedgehogs. So it's, it's about, and the red kites come over and buzzards come over and, and there's now hundreds of species. Skylarks are now singing overhead and, um, Loads of beetles, loads of spiders, grasshoppers, I'm really chuffed with those. You don't often see grasshoppers. I used to see them all the time as a kid, but you, know, but you need longer grass for them. So I'd love to do a proper survey and know exactly what I've got in the garden, really. Yes. Anyway, you can come along and see the garden, Lampenwall Garden. It's open. I'm there most days. I'm not there Mondays and Thursdays. Have a look and be horrified by the wildness and scruffiness of it all. Um, but you might like some bits of it as well. I think I've probably done, Taz, am I? I think so, yes. yes. Thank you very much. What do you want to say about dogs? Dogs? Dogs. Dogs, dogs. <laughs> dogs. yes, I have. I have got a good thing to say, dog. Last thing then, last thing. Yeah. I went to Call the Island about six years ago. And I was on a bit of a mission because I'd seen them promoting this, I shouldn't say this really, it's true. Um, lavender, lavender oil and lavender perfume, lavender soaps. And I thought, oh, lavender on Caldy. Because I grew lavender at Lamphy. It goes really well because it was stony soil. I thought, I'd love to see the lavender fields. So I went over the whole island. I just said to Mission to find this lavender. I asked in the shop, they couldn't tell me where the lavender fields were. I asked on the boat going over, they couldn't tell me where the lavender fields are. I saw one of the monks and chatted to him and he wasn't telling me. He said, oh, we've got some in the courtyard of the monastery, not the kind of monastery of them. And I, I, and I wasn't allowed in there, he wouldn't let me in there. But I, I, I peered through the gates and I saw about four lavender plants, and that's, that doesn't cut out. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't find the lavender, so it's well hidden, let's say. Um, but I did find their old farm. They had a proper old farm at Caldy, didn't they? Probably more than one. And it had been left, set aside, I suppose, or just been left. And it's all rambling and ramshackle and all the worst agricultural weeds have been allowed to just do their thing. And there was dock, creeping thistle, nettle, there was a fourth one. There were four key plants, which are the thugs. You know the really deep rooting thugs? The perennial, the perennials. And there's a field, there's a massive field, probably 30 acres full of these things. I have never seen so many birds flying over one field. Mm -hmm. Swallows and house martins and finches. I've never seen so many because they were all, it must have been late summer, and they were all seeding. So, dock seed is a very valuable, you know, we, we spend fortunes in this country on bird seed. It's bonkers. Fortunes on it, on birds. And we're not allowing the things that they like eating best to seed. It's, it's bonkers. And birds are dying because we're not cleaning out our bird feeders regularly enough. 
because it just sits there and then you've got rats underneath it and it's like, for God's sake. So, you know, nature does it, but you've got to have a space where you can let things seed themselves. So yeah, docks are great for seed-eating birds. It's quite interesting. I have a solid phalanx of hogweed outside, just along the side. Of, there was a lot in my garden and a lot outside last year. Mm. This year's hardly any at all, just suddenly. And I found that with other things, when they're just left completely, they seem to have a cycle they or they come they for they find a particular them. reason. For they do. Yeah, yeah. It's like foxgloves, you clear an area and it goes to foxgloves. And as soon as vegetation comes back in, the foxgloves drop away because they need that light to, to, to grow in their first year. Yeah, and some plants that an old soldier called George planted years and years ago, <laughs> and they totally disappeared for about six or seven, well, for many, many, many years, many tens of years, they've disappeared. And, um, Sort of about six years into the time that I was at this, looking out his garden, suddenly a cyclamen popped up, and, and it was you know I really feel it. it was sort of just hibernating there, and a, um, one of those lovely fritillarias. I'd always wanted to grow yeah. fritillarias, and I'd never really? been able to do it. And I kept thinking, oh, I'd really like to have some fritillarias. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, that's it. And nature's got very much longer cycle than we think in human years all the time. Yeah, and nature doesn't. Just doesn't. Really Th things in hundreds of years. Oh, some some species are hundreds of years. Good. That's a nice story to end on. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs>